All right, everyone. I think we should begin with this session. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for the penultimate session of People Matters Talent Tech Evolve Virtual Conference 2018. And this session is very interesting and very exciting. And I had an opportunity to speak with a speaker before uh, the session actually begins. So I am really, really looking forward to this session. Um, so what are we really discussing in this session? The focus of this session is to learn and explore the six critical social motivations that are reshaping the world at work. And the context here really is um, how employees are expecting consumer good experience uh, at work as well. And with this topic, uh, we have the privilege of having with us Mark Chesner, who's the founder and managing principal for IA. With over 25 years of HR transformation experience, Mark has worked for organizations of every size and vertical. He has spent his career fostering relationships through attention to detail, natural curiosity, and a self-deprecating sense of humor. So uh, we have Mark all set uh, to take us to this session. So don't forget to ask questions because Mark is all excited. And, I, and as I said, he is very curious himself. So keep on flowing your questions uh, using the Q&A tab. And before I hand it over to Mark, let me also remind you, there's a secret code in this session for your leaderboard contest. So keep engaging, keep learning. And with that, over to you, Mark. Thank you so much, Mega. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning from the cold United States, it's early. I've had two cups of coffee. I am ready to absolutely engage with you all today. And, and a, a great thank you to the good folks at People Matters for putting together this event. Thrilled to have the opportunity to, uh, to converse with you this morning on a topic I'm passionate about, which is really the collision, and I use that word intentionally, the collision we're seeing between we as consumers, we as how we engage with brands around the world every single day, and how that's starting to shape our expectations as employees. Um, and, and I'm sure you can attest to the fact that with this lovely device that is tethered to us almost every day, the way in which we have choice, the way in which we embrace with society, we embrace with politics, we embrace with brands of all shapes and sizes, is critically starting to inform and reshape the way that we engage with our employers, the way we think about our candidate experience, the way we think about our entire employee life cycle. From the moment that we have curiosity about a potential employer, through that first day as a new joiner, through the entire life cycle of performance and compensation and succession planning, leadership development, learning, pay, benefits, health and safety, and subsequent retirement, if you're fortunate enough to stay with an organization for that long. I haven't yet, and I'm not intending to for some time. So today I'm gonna to walk you through six critical social motivations and how they're starting to reshape the way in which we embrace the world of work. So let's just jump right in. Um, I am cold because it's snowing outside, so if I'm wearing a sweater and I look all bundled up, it's because I'm trying to stay warm. I hope it's warm where you are but let's talk about the content. Ooh, look at that bouncing stuff just to keep it exciting. Okay, so what's the source of this exciting topic? There's a wonderful agency that I'd recommend you look into called We Are Social. If you go to wearesocial.com, you'll find out more. They're a global agency, and every year they produce a myriad of reports around brands, around social. Uh, because what they do is they support some of the largest brands in the world as an actual advertising agency. A lot of the source material for what I'm going to talk about today came from their 2018 trend report, which focused on, and you'll see it in the middle of your screen, how brands can start to navigate a world of mistrust, misinformation, multiple mindsets. Boy, that sounds so negative. But what they've done is they've tried to shape basically these six notions of certainty, of connection, of belonging, of status progression, et cetera, in a way that lets us think about brands as consumers. The audience for this report, by the way, are the chief marketing officers, the C-suite of some of the largest global entities in the world, really the Global 1000. What I've done today is I've taken this information, I'm gonna use it to reshape the conversation to talk about the applicability to the world of work. And with that long preamble, let's jump right in. So this notion of certainty, we can all relate to this in everything that we do. We want safety and control. We want to apply choice in every facet of our life, from the moment we get up in the morning, to the way in which we care for our children, to the schools in which they go to, to the stores where we shop, 
to the car that we drive, we're looking for more certainty in almost every facet of our life. And the trend that's coming with more certainty is this notion of hyper-transparency. We as humans are expecting, with the click of a button, with the playing of a video, to be able to look in, very intimately look into the brands that we engage with, to understand their ethos, their personality, their sourcing strategies, their social responsibility, and decide whether, in fact, that is the right organization for us to associate with. And as you can imagine, as we think about applicability of certainty to the world of work, we as candidates and we as employees think about work with the same level of hyper-transparency. We want to put the organization under a microscope and constantly test and reassess for fit. Because we as employees often have choices. The script has changed a little bit as the economy has continued to recover. Where there is a crisis, a candidate crisis, a recruitment crisis, whatever crisis you want to subscribe to these days, where organizations are really struggling to find and secure talent. So in many cases, and not in all, depending on where you live, depending on your specialty, depending on the vertical market, depending on your occupational knowledge and how that's trending against societal norms and expectations as employers, you now have choices. You have choices that you intend to apply and your choice is whether or not this is an organization that I want to pour myself into, that I want to put my time, my blood, my sweat, my tears, my capacity into, and as a result, the kinds of compensation, outputs, experiences, and growth that the organization will bring back to me. If we think about this from a brand perspective, what We Are Social has identified is really three outcomes in the category of certainty. You can't just say, if, if brands, if you go to a store today and they say, trust me, just trust me, you would uh, cynically, you might go back and say, validate it, right? I wanna validate that through experiences. If you say, for example, that you're customer focused and you walk into a store and you've got your children with you and you're busy and you're trying to run place to place and you can't find someone to help you, that idea that you're customer facing is blown out of the water. And you might go on a social property and say, you know what, this organization is not living up to its brand. Or you might not, and if you don't, this is the scariest thing for brands right now, you may just quietly take your business elsewhere and then tell your friends about how it took 30 minutes to find an associate to just answer a simple question or find that size of garment that you're seeking in your story experience. We expect organizations to talk about reality, including the bad, right? We expect them to be almost human in some respects, and organizations have a personality, and we want that personality to show. And we want organizations to embrace the fact that at times they could do something better. Um, a clear example is what Apple went through recently around the world where Apple said, yeah, we're not necessarily slowing your phones, but we're trying to optimize your phones to get an upgrade um, for every single release. Well, that level of transparency was really, really helpful, but the cynics say, mm, that explains why my phone was so slow on the last release. Do I want to stay with Apple? Are they trying to force me to buy the next thousand dollar phone? I'm not sure, but Apple can't hide from the reality of that level of transparency. So it's not just the good bets. And then again, take a stand. Is there anything about your organization that should be mysterious? Maybe it's new capabilities, maybe it's new releases. And again, I'm talking about the certainty as a consumer. But now let's drag this into the world of work. And let me show you a couple takeaways. What I'm gonna do is for each of these six things, I'm gonna say there's three takeaways for HR in this category of hyper-transparency against a backdrop of certainty. You need to overcorrect as organizations on what it is actually like to work at your organization. So we had an example recently, we were, had the, the great pleasure of working with a global gaming organization. They run casinos. And they were holding and we were presenting at an all HR conference. And as you imagine, if you've ever been to a casino, if you've ever gambled, if you've ever gone there at night in particular, it is a very, very different environment. People are obsessed with their machines. They don't want to be bothered. They may rub the top, pull the handle, touch it once. The wheels are spinning. And the problem that this particular global gaming organization was having is the retention of servers. Of, of those that are serving drinks, those that are in hospitality. Why? Because the recruiting department, who only works during the day, was seeking candidates that they thought were a good fit. 
One, the leader of the gaming function said, HR, you need to actually spend time on the overnight shift. You need to walk the floor of the casino. You need to see what it's like for our employees who are dealing with people who might be drunk, people who might be excited, people who might be angry. And as a server, what that means to a server experience. Because the worst thing that we can do as an organization is to go through the expense of recruiting, of onboarding, of training someone, only for them to be completely shocked about that first day experience when they're walking the casino floor, drop their tray, and say, I quit. And guess what? That was happening. Turnover was 400% a year, 400% a year in 18 of their casino properties. So in a tough love moment, what the organizational leader said, the business leader who owns gaming says, stop at HR, come and live this experience. Don't talk about the great, wonderful things that happen. Talk about the horrible things that can happen so that we have clear understanding and expectations of what the day-to-day -day reality is for the casino. Owning your career. This notion of hyper-transparency can also be applied to the notion of self-sufficiency. We are finding more and more, and you may find this as well, just think about yourself as an employee, you may find that you wanna be in control. This is part of this notion of safety, where I want to understand exactly where I fit in the organization. I wanna understand exactly what I need to achieve to go to the next level. I wanna understand not once a year, in a performance review where your manager just remembers the thing that happened right before the performance review and not the 11 and a half months of wonderful value that you added, I wanna have constant conversation and feedback. And I wanna transparently know where I stand through a feedback loop so that I am empowered to own my career without the need for disintermediation by a proxy such as HR. And if you're a people leader, people leaders wanna know what it means to own my team. I want to understand the realities of mobility. I want to understand if other parts of the organization could generate lift by recruiting internally, my candidates, if that could advance that person, and are there other people in the queue to fulfill those now empty roles? This notion of ownership is coming up in nearly every strategic plan that we help to shape and guide. And when we spend time with the C-suites of these multi-billion dollar or multi-billion euro entities, what we're finding at the end of the day is that they want, notionally at least, the boards and executives want the idea of employees to own their career, want the idea of people leaders to own their teams. But we've created a proxied relationship where we are over-governing, over-governing people leaders and over-governing employee relations to not let this come to light. So if you want to drive safety and control, you want to embrace hyper-transparency, own your career. Another way of hyper-transparency is stop saying who you are in your employee value proposition. And by the way, if you compare your employee value proposition and the five things that you stand for to your next closest competitors, I would bet that they stand for roughly the same things. <laughs> People are our most important asset, right? That's at the top of almost every list of what your employee value proposition is. But are your employees or your former employees saying that you are living that value? So you might be familiar with the site Glassdoor. Guess what? Love it or hate it, employees and candidates are gonna share how they feel about you through sites like Glassdoor. You might hear of great places to work. We wanna be recognized as one of the best places to work. We wanna show up on a fortune list and we wanna embrace that. We worked with a high technology firm. You know how savvy the employees were? The employees said, employer, how do you want me to respond to that survey? I know that that's important to you as a brand but I need something. And, and what unfortunately happened with this high technology firm is the employees were starting to hold the employer hostage to say, I think you want me to say you're a great place to work. I need you to manage this exception. I need a little bit more PTO. I need a little bit more quiet time. I need a better benefits program that is specific to me. And when you have 25,000 employees that are reversing and flipping the script on blessed places to work and telling management what they need, that fundamentally sort of overturns the notion of a clear and transparent great place to work. So just be careful of what you wish for in that regard. But instead of you saying that you're wonderful, create space for other people to say that you're wonderful. And if they're not saying you're wonderful, then you better study it, you better look for opportunities for improvement, and declare from the rooftop, 
that you're not a great organization and you have opportunities for improvement. That's a way of increasing certainty. All right, I'm gonna pick it up a little bit because I'm just a big talk and I'll just talk myself to death on these things. Okay, connection. You wanna interact with others. We're humans. We see this every day. I just moved to a brand new city. So I'm formerly of San Francisco. I just moved to Nashville, Tennessee, music city. Do I like country music? I'm learning to love country music. Why? Because I need to interact with others in my city of Nashville. So what am I doing? I have to interact with my neighbors. I walk my street. I do things that in a big city like San Francisco, you never did. Why? Because I wore earbuds and I walked around and I was too busy on my phone tweeting and jumping into an Uber and testing self-driving cars, which was kind of fun. It's a whole nother webinar. But automated empathy is the new trend that's coming through interaction. So if we think about automated empathy, what does this even mean? The data that organizations are able to secure through every interaction that you have as consumers. We see this with Amazon.com here in the States, where Amazon knows what we do, what we buy, how we buy it, where it's shipped, who we ship it to, with what frequency, on what occasion, to what demographic and what outcome. And what they can do then is they can send sentiment and start to promote different ideas, different suggestions. We see this on Netflix, if you've ever used Netflix, which is, oh, you watch these things, you're into The Walking Dead and you're crazy about zombies. That's fantastic. Here's other dystopian shows that you might want to reach into because you're worried that the world's going to come to a scratching end. Automated empathy. We can get a sense of what actually ties emotion to action. What the good folks that we are social identified is, okay, how do we derive this in an empathetic way? There's a real-time emotional need that needs to be served and how do brands narrow escape messaging, outcomes, brand services, products directly to you as an individual. Customer service personalization, context, putting content into context, which is so important. So HR, what do we do about this? We have so much data. We and our external service providers have so much data. So how do we start to hyper-personalize the entire life cycle? So we're working with a very, very large global technology firm, Fortune 30. And what they are trying to do is they're trying to hyper-personalize the entire employee experience. So using every bit of data about what you do and how you do it and where you show up, how do we define personas and try to get a sense of your personality, what's important to you in near real time, and how do we shape everything that's available to us in terms of learning content, in terms of mental, physical, fiscal health, and how do we promote that to you in an anticipatory way at a point in need? That requires a level of handshaking and integration with the myriad of external service providers that are part of your HR ecosystem. So we're seeing data hubs that employers are deploying. We're seeing obviously the desire to use big data for experiential input. We're using the ability to subscribe to different medium. So if the employer's permitted or the employer service providers are permitted to actually install applications on your phone, a native app, and I can actually potentially track where you are, we're seeing geofencing for time and attendance, where what I want to know is literally when you showed up on the facility. Now, we had one large manufacturer who used this application, but what they found is that their hourly workers were really smart. They have a video of one gentleman leaning out of his truck window with his phone because he figured out where the edge of the geofence is. His friend was driving, and he logged in for the day by extending his arm over the geofence. So, again, Everything you come up with, there's a clever employee that's gonna find the edges of it, but at the end of the day, we can use data to hyper-personalize this. Now, there was an incident that happened here in the States about a year and a half ago where this went too far. An organization that I know and I will not name, and their third party used healthcare data to anticipate whether an employee was expecting was pregnant. They reached out to that employee to offer all the wonderful services that are available to expectant mothers. But guess what? Who picked up the phone? The husband picked up the phone. The husband wasn't aware yet that his wife was pregnant. So imagine that uncomfortable conversation when a well-meaning HR department with a well-intentioned service provider says, hey, everything that we've seen suggests you might be expecting, we wanna offer these wonderful services to you, 
only to be the person that actually delivered the message that guess what? You've got a new baby boy in the way. Went too far. So I put permitted in parens because we need to allow our employees to one, know what data we're using, but we also need them to have the ability to opt in, not opt out, to opt in and be aware that when we are providing or participating in all of these programs that we are, not unlike we do with every other device, we are giving our employer and their downstream service providers permission to use this data to promote value-added services. And if we're not interested in it, we need to have the ability to opt out. Owning your career, we've talked about solicit sentiment in real time through non-intrusive micro surveys. So this is really fascinating, very quickly. We worked with a large manufacturing organization and here's what they did to get to automated empathy. On the manufacturing floor, in 18 of their manufacturing facilities, when you walked in, they put three buttons on the wall. There was a red button, a yellow button, and a green button. The buttons don't light up. When you walk in every day, and they have buttons all over the warehouse, when you walk in every day, you touch the button. How am I feeling? The premise that they had is that people were coming to work unhappy. What they found out is people were increasingly unhappy as the day went on. <laughs> and so these were in the break rooms. These were all over the organization. And you may have seen these in airports. If you've, if you've been through London Heathrow lately, you know, how was your experience? You know, it might be a smiley face or a frowning face. You might see this in the restroom. I saw this in the restroom actually in Budapest where it's like, how clean is the restroom? Well, it's not very clean. Okay, that's good to know. It was a fascinating exercise because what they could then narrow cast is what was it about that moment in the day that fundamentally shifted the mood of their thousands of producers in these manufacturing facilities? Who was the manager that was actually on duty? And what they actually found is when it went from green to yellow to red or jump to red is when there was an accident. When one of their peers got hurt, everybody went to red, not because they were upset about the employer, but because they, their heartfelt concern was for that injured colleague. Then they knew how to deploy programs to support that. Then they knew how to empower the employees to actually have space and quiet space to grieve if someone was gravely injured. It was a fascinating exercise, real-time, non-intrusive microsurveys to automate empathy and connection. Okay, belonging. This is, all these are sort of no, no doubt, right? You're reading these and you're like, of course organizations need to focus on this. We wanna to belong to a community. So there's this notion of a new cooperative, right? We're dynamically joining organizations as we see fit. We have communities of interest that we participate in every single day. And the idea is that we can jump in and out of those communities as we see fit. Anonymity brings both good and bad achievement in terms of how we participate into social communities and into social cooperatives. So what the good folks that we are social are talking about in brands, trust communities, reward their loyalty, value input. You want strong, formidable voices. You want space for all people to rise and let the community in, right? Open the doors, let them in, let them look into every level of your organization because that level of transparency drives a sense of community and connection. And these communities, if activated, become brand ambassadors. And we've seen this in every facet of our social lives. So what's the HR takeaway? Employee-generated content. We have a large uh, retail beauty company, which you've probably been into their stores. And what they started to do is realize, listen, we were pushing too much content. We're creating e-learning content. We're, we're establishing around the world to our 45,000 associates across our 800 stores, so what if we flip it, and what if we let employees use their phones and all the expertise that they have in makeup application, in brands, in different ways in which makeup is applied around the world to socially enable our population for employee-generated content, for associate-generated content in their parlance. And that created a whole different level of communication and connection because Heretofore, people were really thinking about isolation to their geography, to their store, to their country. This opened up a global community of interest, fostered a sense of common brand across this global entity, across their parent entity, a luxury holding entity that you're very familiar with. But the employees had to be permitted 
And the employer had to take a risk that we trust employees to do the right thing, share appropriate content. And guess what? The real-time connection, the ability for people to vote content up and down, ended up being self-governing. This is part of the new cooperative that we're speaking to. The other thing is, stop imposing change from above. The traditional hierarchy of belonging, where the pyramid of the C-suite says, you belong. And then the next level says, I think you belong. And the next level says, you really belong to my organization, but you don't belong to the rest of the company. You need to start flipping this again. Everything I seem to say is flip, so you get a, you get a reward if you can track how many times I've said flip in this presentation. Don't employ, impose change from above. Every facet of HR is changing. Every organization is changing dynamically. It's happening in near real time. So the moment I'm done with this presentation, you have absolutely changed and evolved as an organization. The best way to enable belonging is to get down in the trenches and let your people define what belonging means to them. You can't tell people that they belong. It has to be a feeling. And if there's dissonance between what you're trying to convey and what is actually felt on the ground, you need to uncover that as quickly as possible. Don't foster this from the top. And then fun means to foster communities of interest. Keeping intrusion low. Your job is to facilitate a safe space where every type of individual, we are unique, we are, I'm looking out the window, we are snowflakes, right? I'll use the analogy of what I'm looking out my window and seeing right now. We are unique. We have unique attributes, unique beliefs. We need to have space to assemble. We need to have space to develop communities of interest, regardless of whether or not it is perceived to be in the employer's best interest. So this notion of keeping intrusion low and creating and funding spaces where those who belong ranging from a sport group, sporting group to a religious affiliation. We are whole humans. Belonging requires the embracing of the whole human. Okay, moving on, how am I doing on time? All right, we're cranking along. Mega, how are we doing? We're doing okay? We're doing okay, Mark. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of questions coming in, so okay. I will wait for you to take, uh, take us through Q&A whenever you are done. Okay, sounds good, thank you so much. All right, status, validation. We all wanna be validated, right? In one way, shape or form, I'm validated right now because you guys were so wonderful as to invite me to this session. You're validated because you can embrace in Q&A and you can actually take these ideas forward. So how do we validate society? Guess what? Micro is macro. We are done, 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 done with these influencers telling us what we're supposed to believe. We are done with these stars that say, this is what you are. No, we are what we are. The trend is micro is macro. We are down to markets of one. So micro communities, advocates, communities need to have a greater understanding of who you are as an organization and how do you raise the status of the individual. These are pretty obvious for HR democratize your organization. And this is, really, this is really controversial, right? Pay transparency, oh my gosh, it is so, so scary for most organizations. We were working with an organization recently who didn't even let the managers know what the compensation of their employees were. So the managers didn't even have pay transparency to their own people. That's not really fostering a sense of trust and giving managers a sense of owning their teams. Pay transparency is on the rise. And the real question we have to ask ourselves on pay transparency is, what are we afraid of? What we're honestly afraid of is exposing the deltas and potentially biases for and against certain portions of our population. Pay transparency is hard. So it's easy for me to jump in on a, a video conference and say, just do pay transparency, have a wonderful evening and best of luck with this. This requires very thoughtful consideration. But here's what we found. For our client organizations who are starting to embrace pay transparency, many are doing pilots in what they consider to be at-risk portions of their organization. When they've started to expose pay transparency, it's forced a conversation into the open that the way in which you are validating and rewarding of employees is in fact different. For example, one organization that we were working with, a large consumer packaged goods organization, guess what they found? that those that were long-term employees were getting paid worse than new joiners. Think about this for a moment. Why? 
Because if you joined 10 years ago, and every year you're given an increase, your increase may not actually match the current status of the market. And if your compensation function hasn't repriced your job in a long time, and you weren't therefore re-engaged in that repricing, where you fall within position in the range, relative to your comp ratios, et cetera, you may find that your long-term employees are actually further behind than your new joiners. Because you've given them 5% a year because they're great and they're absolutely exceeding expectations. But guess what? The market moved 80% for that position. And in that geography where you're also placing the employees, the market has moved 180%. So how do you reset the clock? And it looks like, oh my gosh, Mark's going to get a 90% pay increase. There's no way that's possible. Well, well, Mark talks to his colleagues. This information is known. So the notion employee, employers have that employees don't talk to each other and no one talks about compensation, it's a false premise. Pay transparency is something we need to embrace. All right, reverse mentoring. You wanna validate, you know, we, you know what we hear often? My door is open. I'm an executive, my door is open. You know how much confidence it takes for an entry level associate or an individual to walk through that door? You know how hard it is to schedule time to walk through that door? CFO says, Come to me anytime. How often does that really happen? So here's the, here's the recommendation. Reverse mentoring. Have your C-suite get mentored by the lowest level of your organization, not the other way around. You will learn more. The organizations that do this, we're working with a large, another large global retailer that started to do reverse mentoring programs. They were shocked by the results because it creates a space for listening. It really gets down to what is important to that level of the organization. This isn't undercover boss, right? We don't have to put on a wig and fake glasses and go into a store and pretend that we're just like them. Just go and talk to your people and embrace the fact, and this is why reverse mentoring is so powerful. I can learn from you. Reverse mentoring basically confirms that you are an important asset and you have something valuable to add to me. And I'm gonna to come to you for that information, not the other way around. Okay, create and promote alumni groups. Guess what? People are gonna leave your organization. There's this notion of promoting out. And a lot of people have done this. You may belong to LinkedIn groups for all the different organizations you need you used to work for. These are fantastic opportunities because a mature organization can say, Mega, you've done a great job. I love you. I love the work you're doing at People Matters. Go grow on someone else's dime, right? Go out there and go create lift. Go learn and come back. Come back stronger. Come back with more experience. Come back with more education. Travel the world. Do whatever is appropriate for you, but stay connected to us. So don't take people leaving quite so personally as an organization. Take it as an opportunity to wish them well, to see them off, to stay connected, and to hopefully bring them back. Mm -hmm. And use candidate relationship management tools now for your alumnus, for your alumni. So I didn't leave IA, I'm an alumni of IA, right? Just like you're an alumnus of your college or university. So I'm always connected. And there's information that can be promoted. And when the right opportunity comes about, maybe I'll come back. And I'll come back with good graces because I left with good graces. Okay. Progression. We're layered individuals. There's this notion of 4D thinking, right? We are deep. We are complex. And we need to have spaces to learn and to grow personally and professionally. This, this just happened today. Today is International Women's Day, by the way. So thank you. For all the women that are out there, I don't know if you saw this, McDonald's flipped their logo. Very they flipped, interesting. Yeah, so they flipped their logo upside down to embrace and celebrate International Women's Day, to overtly embrace the Me Too movement, if you're familiar with that movement. And they're smart, one, because McDonald's is prevalent around the world, and, and it is a moment right now where women are powerful and it's about time. Okay, let me just say it, it's about time. It's been a long time coming. But the other thing, if you're thoughtful about McDonald's, two thirds of McDonald's stores are run by women. They want to recruit 
more women, more female leaders. They want to promote this. This is important to their brand. This is important to their talent strategy. And honestly, it's just the right thing to do. And what a clever, clever campaign. What a clever campaign. And they've actually done this for some of their stores. They had big cranes come, pick up the McDonald's logo, flip it upside down. People were wondering what was going on. But I applaud what they're trying to do. All right, so 4D thinking. Multifaceted approaches, et cetera. Let me cut to why this matters to HR. All right. You have to acknowledge those disenfranchised by your current organizational reality. I was working with an organization five years ago, in fact. This is, this is what happened. They were trying to create a clever way of showing the difference between female leadership and male leadership. So they created gingerbread people. And for every 5,000 men and 5,000 women that were in managerial positions, they had a gingerbread person, a little cookie. They showed it to the board. Gingerbread man, gingerbread man, gingerbread man. One and a half gingerbread women. The ratio was 27 to one. And they did it in such a clever way, you can't ignore the graphic. It wasn't a number on a page, it was a visual. It was around the holidays, it was around uh, you know, around the December time frame, so people were cooking and baking, et cetera, um, in this organization's headquarters. That was an image that stuck. And guess what they had to do? They couldn't ignore it. Guess what they did? They put it in the public square. They put it out overtly. They made a promise to their organization. They held themselves accountable to monthly metrics. And they achieved balance over the course of an 18-month transformation but it requires overt acknowledgement. This isn't something to be reserved for the back office. This is something that needs to be brought into the light of day. This notion, we talk a lot about diversity inclusion. What are we doing about neurodiversity? And I'm not talking just about those with developmental challenges, but certainly we wanna create employment opportunities for those as well. My wife, for example, is an introvert. She's not shy, she's an introvert. <laughs> And what introverted people often need is they need space to process. So if you hold a meeting, let's say you're a manager and you hold a meeting and you look around the table and you've got a really extroverted guy like me, who's your manager, and I'm going around and I'm saying, Jim, John, what do you think about this? Sally, Joan, what do you think? Guess what? That is not a safe space for those who have neurodiverse processing. I may need to think about what was conveyed in that meeting. I, as a manager, need to acknowledge that I have different thinking individuals, different processing individuals, and create an opportunity to not force that conversation in that moment, but to create space for thoughtful consideration and take it offline. This is an example of neurodiversity and processing diversity, and I'd like to see more of it in the organizations. All right, embrace the whole person. I talked about this earlier. Space for separation. I used to work for the largest call center provider in the world. I was a senior executive for that multi-billion dollar organization. And guess what? They dealt with death processing. And what I mean by death processing is when we actually run into an occasion where an employee has passed away and the survivors are calling. Imagine those conversations day after day after day. We have to create space for those people to get away, to have quiet space, to bring joy back into their life because they are dealing with death every single day. Embrace the whole person. All right, conscious. I'm gonna go really quickly. The unfight club. Fight, but don't fight. Become a civil facilitator. There's this notion of civil engagement with those that disagree with you. If people are bashing you on social channels, your employees and candidates, listen engage with them. Don't delete it. Don't ignore them. Engage with them. Encourage employee activism. We're seeing this more and more. If there's an election coming up, give people the day off. Give them time. Give them a space to engage and advocate for employee rights. HR is under the microscope right now because case in case keeps coming up where I went to HR and HR did nothing. Advocate. Advocate openly, become the advocate for the employee again, because HR is often accused, unfortunately, of being the advocate for the employer. So we need to change that conversation. All right, 
I probably went over. Mega, thanks for the watch. Stay connected with me. This is a conversation. Go to voiceofhr.com if you'd like to subscribe to everything that we talk about and publish. There's all my contact information. I encourage you to reach out through any medium that's appropriate. Okay, Mega, questions? Thank you so much, Mark. We have a lot of questions coming in, but I'm just conscious about everyone's time because we're two minutes over the session already. Oh, no. So, yes. So what I will do is, Mark, I am just looking at the question and one of the questions strongly come and I would want to put that question to you. And I'd request you to be brief if we could just answer the question in a minute. Sure. Uh, and of course, I'm sure the audience can catch you in the conference and also you've already shared your details. So I'm sure they have made a note of it already. So one question that has come up strongly, Mark, two, three times is around the transparency piece. Uh, just to sum it up, if I were to club all the questions, that's really around, uh, there is a reason around why compensation and benefits differ across people. Uh, do you think making the transparency will, uh, instead of bringing clarity, create a lot more chaos? What are your thoughts on it? And I know it's a difficult question, but I can only give you 60 seconds for that. Oh, no, question. no, that's fine. I'll, I talk really fast, so I'll do my best. Um, <laughs> it, ab it absolutely will create chaos, but I think it'll create the right kind of chaos. The reality is that not every position is created equal in your organization. Not every employee is privy to the same benefits. Not every part of your organization is equitable. So if we're trying to, again, reverse this to say, we want people to assess us for fit, and we want to assess people for fit, we need to expose the realities about each facet of our organization. I think the fear of transparency is if we show too much, will people want to work for us anymore? And how do we deal with that intermediate chaos? This is why maybe pilot programs are really interesting. If you have a challenging portion of your organization where you could test the notion of transparency, see how your employees react, and actually ensure that you have the capacity to deal with the ensuing chaos. Because chaos will ensue, certainly, but it'll ensue in a productive way to force you to take action on those activities, which will create more parity, and again, more believability into how one progresses and joins and benefits from all the great investments that you make as an employer every single day. So if you're really fearful, start with a pilot program, pick a safe space, learn from that, and then thoughtfully expand uh, across the enterprise in a timely fashion. But thanks for the question. I love the question. Thanks, Mary. Thank you so much, Mark. Very well put. Thank you. And with that, Mark, I will have to stop the session and not take any more questions. I'm so sorry to the audience and to you as well, because I can see 14 questions in. We'll share those questions with you, Mark. If you could share the responses offline, I'm sure it will be fantastic for our audience and we'll share it with them. I'd be happy to. And my apologies for going over. I'm obviously passionate about this. Thank you to People Matters. Thank you to all of you. Have a wonderful evening, day, morning, wherever you are. It's been my pleasure to join you today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. And thank you, everyone, for joining us for this session. Before I close this session, I promised you the secret code for the leaderboard contest. So just make a note of it. The secret code is hashtag SOCMOT. 1-8. So that is SOC from social and MOT from motivation. Uh, so the code is SOCMOT18. This is your second last opportunity to put in your code and get the points. So please do that. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we'll take a break for about 15 minutes and we will be back with our last session for People Matters Talent Tech Evolve Virtual Conference. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you so much, Mark. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.